atmosphere, that is, before we started inflating it with industrial activity, is about 280 parts per million. By 1958, when people in lab coats started to pay attention to it, it had risen to 315 parts per million. <coughs> Today, it is over 360 parts per million and rising by roughly one quarter of one percent a year. By the end of the 21st century, it is forecast to rise to about 560 parts per million. So far, the Earth's oceans and forests, which also pack away a lot of carbon, have managed to save us from ourselves. But as Peter Cox of the British Meteorological Office puts it, there is a critical threshold where the natural biosphere stops buffering us from the effects of our emissions and actually starts to amplify them. The fear is that there will be a very rapid increase in the Earth's warming. Unable to adapt, many trees and other plants would die, releasing their stores of carbon and adding to the problem. Such cycles have occasionally happened in the distant past, even without a human contribution. The good news is that even here, nature is quite wonderful. It is almost certain that eventually the carbon cycle would reassert itself and return the Earth to a situation of stability and happiness. The last time this happened, it took a mere 60,000 years. 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 Chapter 18, The Bounding Main. Imagine trying to live in a world dominated by dihydrogen oxide, a compound that has no taste or smell and is so variable in its properties that it is generally benign, but at other times, swiftly lethal. Depending on its state, it can scald you or freeze you. In the presence of certain organic molecules, it can form carbonic acid so nasty that they can strip the leaves from trees and eat the faces off statuary. In bulk, when agitated, it can strike with a fury that no human edifice could withstand. Even for those who have learned to live with it, it is an often murderous substance. We call it water. Water is everywhere. A potato is 80% water, a cow 74%, a bacterium 75%. A tomato at 95% is little but water. Even humans are 65% water, making us more liquid than solid by a margin of almost two to one. Water is strange stuff. It is formless and transparent, and yet we long to be beside it. It has no taste, and yet we love the taste of it. We will travel great distances and pay small fortunes to see it in sunshine. And even though we know it is dangerous and drowns tens of thousands of people every year, we can't wait to frolic in it. Because water is so ubiquitous, we tend to overlook what an extraordinary substance it is. Almost nothing about it can be used to make reliable predictions about the properties of other liquids, and vice versa. If you knew nothing of water and based your assumptions on the behavior of compounds most chemically akin to it, hydrogen selenide, or hydrogen sulfide, notably, you would expect it to boil at minus 93 degrees Celsius and to be a gas at room temperature. Most liquids, when chilled, contract by about 10%. Water does too, but only down to a point. Once it is within whispering distance of freezing, it begins, perversely, beguilingly, extremely improbably, to expand. By the time it is a solid, it is almost a tenth more voluminous than it was before. Because it expands, ice floats on water, an utterly bizarre property, according to John Gribben. If it lacked this splendid waywardness, ice would sink and lakes and oceans would freeze from the bottom up. Without surface ice to hold heat in, the water's warmth would radiate away, leaving it even chillier and creating yet more ice. Soon even the oceans would freeze, and almost certainly stay that way for a very long time, probably forever. Hardly the conditions to nurture life. Thankfully for us, water seems unaware of the rules of chemistry or the laws of physics. 
Everyone knows that water's chemical formula is H2O, which means that it consists of one largish oxygen atom with two smaller hydrogen atoms attached to it. The hydrogen atoms cling fiercely to their oxygen host, but also make casual bonds with other water molecules. The nature of a water molecule means that it engages in a kind of dance with other water molecules, briefly pairing and then moving on, like the ever-changing partners in a quadrille, to use Robert Kunzig's nice phrase. A glass of water may not appear terribly lively, but every molecule in it is changing partners billions of times a second. That's why water molecules stick together, to form bodies like puddles and lakes, but not so tightly that they can't be easily separated, as when, for instance, you dive into a pool of them. At any given moment, only 15% of them are actually touching. In one sense, the bond is very strong. It is why water molecules can flow uphill when siphoned, and why water droplets on a car bonnet show such a singular determination to bead with their partners. It is also why water has surface tension. The molecules at the surface are attracted more powerfully to the like molecules beneath and beside them than to the air molecules above. This creates a sort of membrane strong enough to support insects and skipping stones it is what gives the sting to a belly flop. I hardly need to point out that we would be lost without it. Deprived of water, the human body rapidly falls apart. Within days, the lips vanish, as if amputated. The gums blacken, the nose withers to half its length, and the skin so contracts around the eyes as to prevent blinking, according to one account. Water is so vital to us, that it is easy to overlook that all but the smallest fraction of the water on earth is poisonous to us, deadly poisonous, because of the salts within it. We need salt to live, but only in very small amounts, and sea water contains way more, about 70 times more salt than we can safely metabolize. A typical liter of seawater will contain only about 2.5 teaspoons of common salt the kind we sprinkle on food, but much larger amounts of other elements, compounds and other dissolved solids, which are collectively known as salts. The proportions of these salts and minerals in our tissues are uncannily similar to those in seawater. We sweat and cry seawater, as Margulis and Sagan have put it, but curiously, we cannot tolerate them as an input. Take a lot of salt into your body and your metabolism very quickly goes into crisis. From every cell, water molecules rush off like so many volunteer firemen to try to dilute and carry off the sudden intake of salt. This leaves the cells dangerously short of the water they need to carry out their normal functions. They become, in a word, dehydrated. In extreme situations, dehydration will lead to seizures, unconsciousness, and brain damage. Well, no, Meanwhile, the overworked hey, blood cells what? carry the salt to the kidneys, <clears throat> which eventually become overwhelmed and hey, shut down. Without functioning kidneys, you die. That is why we don't drink seawater. There are 1.3 billion cubic well, kilometers of water hey, on hey, Earth. And that is all we're ever going to get. The system is closed. Practically speaking, nothing can be added or subtracted. The water you drink has been around doing its job since the Earth was young. By 3.8 billion years ago, the oceans had, at least more or less, achieved their present volumes. The water realm is known as the hydrosphere, and it is overwhelmingly oceanic. 97% of all the water on Earth is in the seas, the greater part of it in the Pacific, which is bigger than all the land masses put together. Altogether, the Pacific holds just over half of all the ocean water, 51.6%. The Atlantic has 23.6%, and the Indian Ocean 21.2%, leaving just 3.6% to be accounted for by all the other seas. The average depth of the ocean is 3.86 kilometers, with the Pacific on average about 300 meters deeper than the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. 60% of the planet's surface is ocean more than 1.6 kilometers deep. As Philip Ball notes, 
we would better call our planet not Earth, but water. Of the 3% of Earth's water that is fresh, most exists as ice sheets. Only the tiniest amount, 0.036%, is found in lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. And an even smaller part, just 0.001%, exists in clouds or as vapor. Nearly 90% of the planet's ice is in Antarctica, and most of the rest is in Greenland. Go to the South Pole, and you will be standing on over two miles of ice. At the North Pole, just 15 feet of it. Antarctica alone has six million cubic miles of ice, enough to raise the oceans by a height of 200 feet if it all melted. But if all the water in the atmosphere fell as rain, evenly, everywhere, the oceans would deepen by only a couple of centimeters. Sea level, incidentally, is an almost entirely notional concept. Seas are yeah. not level at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tides, winds, the Coriolis force and other effects alter water levels considerably from one ocean to another and even within oceans. The Pacific is about a foot and a half higher along its western edge, a consequence of the centrifugal force created by the Earth's spin. <coughs> Just as when you pull on a tub of water, the water tends to flow towards the other end, as if reluctant to come with you, so the eastward spin of Earth piles water up against the ocean's western margins. Considering the age-old importance of the seas to us, it is striking how long it took the world to take a scientific interest in them. Until well into the 19th century, most of what was known about the oceans was based on what washed ashore or came up in fishing nets. And nearly all that was written was based more on anecdote and supposition than on physical evidence. In the 1830s, the British naturalist Edward Forbes surveyed ocean beds throughout the Atlantic and Mediterranean and declared that there was no life at all in the seas below 600 meters. It seemed a reasonable assumption. There was no light at that depth, so no plant life. And the pressures of water at such depths were known to be extreme. So it came as something of a surprise when in 1860, one of the first transatlantic telegraph cables was hauled up for repairs from more than three kilometers down and found to be thickly encrusted with corals, clams, and other living detritus. The first really organized investigation of the seas didn't come until 1872, when a joint expedition set up by the British Museum, the Royal Society, and the British government set forth from Portsmouth on a former warship called HMS Challenger. For three and a half years, they sailed the world, sampling waters, netting fish, and hauling a dredge through sediments. It was evidently dreary work. Out of a complement of 240 scientists and crew, one in four jumped ship, and eight more died or went mad, driven to distraction by the mind-numbing routine of years of dredging in the words of the historian Samantha Weinberg. But they sailed across almost 70,000 nautical miles of sea, collected over 4,700 new species of marine organisms, gathered enough information to create a 50-volume report, which took 19 years to put together, and gave the world the name of a new scientific discipline, oceanography. They also discovered, by means of depth measurements, that there appeared to be submerged mountains in mid-Atlantic, prompting some excited observers to speculate that they had found the lost continent of Atlantis. Because the institutional world mostly ignored the seas, it fell to devoted and very occasional amateurs to tell us what was down there. Modern deep water exploration begins with Charles William Beebe and Otis Barton in 1930. Although they were equal partners, the more colorful B.B. has always received far more written attention. Born in 1877 into a well-to-do family in New York City, B.B. studied zoology at Columbia University, then took a job as a bird keeper at the New York Zoological Society. Tiring of that, he decided to adopt the life of an adventurer, and for the next quarter century, traveled extensively through Asia and South America with a succession of attractive female assistants whose jobs were inventively described as historian and technicist or assistant in fish problems. 
He supported these endeavors with a succession of popular books with titles like Edge of the Jungle and Jungle Days, though he also produced some respectable books on wildlife and ornithology. In the mid-1920s, on a trip to the Galapagos Islands, he discovered the delights of dangling, as he described deep-sea diving. Soon afterwards, he teamed up with Barton, who came from an even wealthier family, had also attended Columbia and also longed for adventure. Although B.B. nearly always gets the credit, it was in fact Barton who designed the first bathysphere, from the Greek word for deep, and funded the $12,000 cost of its construction. It was a tiny and necessarily robust chamber, made of cast iron, 1.5 inches thick, and with two small portholes containing quartz blocks three inches thick. It held two men, but only if they were prepared to become extremely well acquainted. Even by the standards of the age, the technology was unsophisticated. The sphere had no maneuverability. It simply hung on the end of a long cable. And only the most primitive breathing system. To neutralize their own carbon dioxide, they set out open cans of soda lime. And to absorb moisture, they opened a small tub of calcium chloride, over which they sometimes waved palm fronds to encourage chemical reactions. But the nameless little bathysphere did the job it was intended to do. On the first dive in June 1930 in the Bahamas, Barton and Beebe set a world record by descending to 183 meters. By 1934, they had pushed the record to over 900 meters, where it would stay until after the Second World War. Barton was confident the device was safe to a depth of about 1,400 meters, though the strain on every bolt and rivet was audibly evident with every fathom they descended. At any depth, it was brave and risky work. At 900 meters, their little porthole was subjected to 19 tons of pressure per square inch. Should they pass the structure's limits of tolerance, death at such a depth would have been instantaneous, as B.B. never failed to observe in his many books, articles, and radio broadcasts. Their main concern, however, was that the shipboard winch, straining to hold on to a metal ball and two tons of steel cable, would snap and send the two men plunging to the sea floor. In such an event, nothing could have saved them. The one thing their descents didn't produce was a great deal of worthwhile science. Although they encountered many creatures that had not been seen before, the limits of visibility and the fact that neither of the intrepid aquanauts was a trained oceanographer meant they weren't often able to describe their findings in the kind of detail that real scientists craved. The sphere didn't carry an external light, merely a 250-watt bulb they could hold up to the window. But the water below 150 meters was practically impenetrable anyway, and they were peering into it through three so inches okay. of quartz. So anything they hoped to view would have to be nearly as interested in them as they were in it. About all they could report in consequence was that there were a lot of strange things down there. On one dive in 1934, Bibi was startled to spy a giant serpent, more than 20 feet long and very wide. It passed too swiftly to be more than a shadow. Whatever it was, nothing like it has been seen by anyone since. Because of such vagueness, the reports were generally ignored by academics. After their record-breaking descent of 1934, Bibi lost interest in diving and moved on to other adventures. But Barton persevered. To his credit, Bibi always told anyone who asked that Barton was the real brains behind the enterprise, but Barton seemed unable to step from the shadows. He too wrote thrilling accounts of their underwater adventures, and even starred in a Hollywood movie called Titans of the Deep, featuring a bathysphere and many exciting and largely fictionalized encounters with aggressive giant squid and the like. He even advertised camel cigarettes. They don't give me jittery nerves. In 1948, he increased the depth record by 50% with a dive to 1,370 meters in the Pacific Ocean near California. But the world seemed determined to overlook him. One newspaper reviewer of Titans of the Deep actually thought the star of the film was B.B. Nowadays, Barton is lucky to get a mention. At all events, he was about to be comprehensively eclipsed by a father and son team from Switzerland.
Auguste and Jacques Picard, who were designing a new type of probe called a bathyscaphe, meaning deep boat. Christened Trieste, after the Italian city in which it was built, the new device maneuvered independently, though it did little more than just go up and down. On one of its early dives, in early 1954, it descended to below 4,000 meters, nearly three times Barton's record-breaking dive of six years earlier. But deep-sea dives required a great deal of costly support, and the P-cars were gradually going broke. In 1958, they did a deal with the U.S. Navy, which gave the Navy ownership but left them in control. Now flush with funds, the Picars rebuilt the vessel, giving it walls nearly 13 centimeters thick and shrinking the windows to just 5 centimeters in diameter, little more than peepholes. But it was now strong enough to withstand truly enormous pressures. And in January 1960, Jacques Picard and Lieutenant Don Walsh of the U.S. Navy sank slowly to the bottom of the ocean's deepest canyon, the Mariana Trench, some 400 kilometers off Guam in the Western Pacific, and discovered not incidentally by Harry Hess with his fathometer. It took just under four hours to fall 10,918 meters, or almost seven miles. Although the pressure at that depth was nearly 17,000 pounds per square inch, they noticed with surprise that they disturbed a bottom-dwelling flatfish just as they touched down. They had no facilities for taking photographs, so there is no visual record of the event. After just 20 minutes at the world's deepest point, they returned to the surface. It was the only occasion in which human beings have gone so deep. Forty years later, the question that naturally occurs is, why has no one gone back since? To begin with, further dives were vigorously opposed by Vice Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, a man with a lively temperament, forceful views, and, most pertinently, control of the departmental checkbook. He thought underwater exploration a waste of resources, and pointed out that the Navy was not a research institute. The nation, moreover, was about to become fully preoccupied with space travel and the quest to send a man to the moon, which made deep-sea investigations seem unimportant and rather old-fashioned. But the decisive consideration is that the Trieste descent didn't actually achieve much. As a Navy official explained years later, we didn't learn a hell of a lot from it, other than that we could do it. Why do it again? It was, in short, a long way to go to find a flatfish, and expensive, too. Repeating the exercise today, it has been estimated, would cost at least $100 million. When underwater researchers realized that the Navy had no intention of pursuing a promised exploration program, there was a pained outcry. Partly to placate its critics, the Navy provided funding for a more advanced submersible, to be operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution of Massachusetts. Called Alvin, in somewhat contracted honor of the oceanographer Alan C. Vine, it would be a fully maneuverable mini-submarine, though it wouldn't go anywhere near as deep as Trieste. There was just one problem. The designers couldn't find anyone willing to build it. According to William J. Broad in The Universe Below, no big company like General Dynamics, which made submarines for the Navy, wanted to take on a project disparaged by both the Bureau of Ships and Admiral Rickover, the gods of naval patronage. Eventually, not to say improbably, Alvin was constructed by General Mills, the food company, at a factory where it made the machines to produce breakfast cereals. As for what else was down there, people really had very little idea. Well into the 1950s, the best maps available to oceanographers were overwhelmingly based on a little detail from scattered surveys going back to 1929, grafted onto, essentially, an ocean of guesswork. The U.S. Navy had excellent charts with which to guide submarines through canyons and around guillots, but it didn't wish such information to fall into Soviet hands, so it kept its knowledge classified. Academics, therefore, had to make do with sketchy and antiquated surveys or rely on hopeful surmise. 
Even today, our knowledge of the ocean floors remains remarkably low resolution. If you look at the moon with a standard backyard telescope, you will see substantial craters, Fracastorius, Blancanus, Zach, Planck, and many others familiar to any lunar scientist that would be unknown if they were on our own ocean floors. We have better maps of Mars than we do of our own seabeds. At the surface level, investigative techniques have also been a trifle ad hoc. In 1994, 34,000 ice hockey gloves were swept overboard from a Korean cargo ship during a storm in the Pacific. The gloves washed up all over, from Vancouver to Vietnam, helping oceanographers to trace currents more accurately than they ever had before. Today, Alvin is nearly 40 years old, but it remains the world's premier research vessel. There are still no submersibles that can go anywhere near the depth of the Mariana Trench, and only five, including Alvin, that can reach the depths of the abyssal plain, the deep ocean floor, which covers more than half the planet's surface. A typical submersible costs about $25,000 a day to operate. So they are hardly dropped into the water on a whim, still less put to sea in the hope that they will randomly stumble on something of interest. It's rather as if our first-hand experience of the surface world were based on the work of five guys exploring on garden tractors after dark. According to Robert Kunzig, humans may have scrutinized perhaps a millionth or a billionth of the sea's darkness, maybe less, maybe much less. But oceanographers are nothing if not industrious, and they have made several important discoveries with their limited resources including, in 1977, one of the most important and startling biological discoveries of the 20th century. In that year, Alvin found teeming colonies of large organisms living on and around deep sea vents off the Galapagos Islands. Tube worms over three meters long, clams 30 centimeters wide, shrimps and mussels in profusion, wriggling spaghetti worms. They all owed their existence to vast colonies of bacteria that were deriving their energy and sustenance from hydrogen sulfides, compounds profoundly toxic to surface creatures, that were pouring steadily from the vents. It was a world independent of sunlight, oxygen, or anything else normally associated with life. This was a living system based not on photosynthesis, but on chemosynthesis, an arrangement that biologists would have dismissed as preposterous had anyone been imaginative enough to suggest it. Huge amounts of heat and energy are released by these vents. Two dozen of them together will produce as much energy as a large power station, and the range of temperatures around them is enormous. The temperature at the point of outflow can be as much as 400 degrees Celsius, while a couple of meters away, the water may be only two or three degrees above freezing. A type of worm called alvinolids were found living right on the margins, with a water temperature 78 degrees Celsius warmer at their heads than at their tails. Before this, it had been thought that no complex organisms could survive in water warmer than about 54 degrees Celsius. And here was one that was surviving warmer temperatures than that and extreme cold to boot. The discovery transformed our understanding of the requirements for life. It also answered one of the great puzzles of oceanography, something that many of us didn't realize was a puzzle, namely, why the oceans don't grow saltier with time. At the risk of stating the obvious, there is a lot of salt in the sea, enough to bury every bit of land on the planet to a depth of about 150 meters. It had been known for centuries that rivers carry minerals to the sea and that these minerals combine with ions in the ocean water to form salts. So far, no problem. But what was puzzling was that the salinity levels of the sea were stable. Millions of gallons of fresh water evaporate from the ocean daily, leaving all their salts behind. So, logically, the seas ought to grow more salty with the passing years. But they don't. Something takes an amount of salt out of the water equivalent to the amount being put in. For a very long time, no one could figure out what could be responsible for this. 
Alvin's discovery of the deep sea vents provided the answer. Geophysicists realized that the vents were acting much like the filters in a fish tank. As water is taken down into the Earth's crust, salts are stripped from it, and eventually clean water is blown out again through the chimney stacks. The process is not swift. It can take up to 10 million years to clean an ocean. But if you're not in a hurry, it is marvelously efficient. Perhaps nothing speaks more clearly of our psychological remoteness from the ocean depths than that the main expressed goal for oceanographers during International Geophysical Year 1957-8 was to study the use of ocean depths for the dumping of radioactive wastes. This wasn't a secret assignment, you understand, but a proud public boast. In fact, though it wasn't much publicized, by 1957 to 8, the dumping of radioactive wastes had already been going on with a certain appalling vigor for over a decade. Since 1946, the United States had been ferrying 55 gallon drums of radioactive gunk out to the Falarone Islands, some 50 kilometers off the California coast near San Francisco, where it simply threw them overboard. It was all quite extraordinarily sloppy. Most of the drums were exactly the sort you see rusting behind petrol stations or standing outside factories with no protective linings of any type. When they failed to sink, which was usually, Navy gunners riddled them with bullets to let water in and, of course, plutonium, uranium and strontium out. Before this dumping was halted in the 1990s, the United States had dumped many hundreds of thousands of drums into about 50 ocean sites almost 50,000 of them in the Falarones alone. But the United States was by no means alone. Among the other enthusiastic dumpers were Russia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and nearly all the nations of Europe. And what effect might all this have had on life beneath the seas? Well, little, we hope, but we actually have no idea. We are astoundingly, sumptuously, radiantly ignorant of life beneath the seas. Even the most substantial ocean creatures are often remarkably little known to us, including the most mighty of them all, the great blue whale, a creature of such leviathan proportions that, to quote David Attenborough, its tongue weighs as much as an elephant, its heart is the size of a car, and some of its blood vessels are so wide that you could swim down them. It is the most gargantuan beast the Earth has yet produced, bigger even than the most cumbrous dinosaurs. Yet the lives of blue whales are largely a mystery to us. Much of the time we have no idea where they are, where they go to breed, for instance, or what routes they follow to get there. What little we know of them comes almost entirely from eavesdropping on their songs, but even these are a mystery. Blue whales will sometimes break off a song then pick it up again at exactly the same spot six months later. Sometimes they strike up with a new song, which no member can have heard before, but which each already knows. How they do this and why are not remotely understood. And these are animals that must routinely come to the surface to breathe. For animals that need never surface, obscurity can be even more tantalizing. Consider our knowledge of the fabled giant squid. Though nothing on the scale of the blue whale, it is a decidedly substantial animal, with eyes the size of soccer balls and trailing tentacles that can reach lengths of 18 meters. It weighs nearly a ton and is Earth's largest invertebrate. If you dumped one in a small swimming pool, there wouldn't be much room for anything else. Yet no scientist, no person, as far as we know, has ever seen a giant squid alive. Zoologists have devoted careers to trying to capture or just glimpse living giant squid and have always failed. They are known mostly from being washed up on beaches, particularly for unknown reasons, the beaches of the South Island of New Zealand. They must exist in large numbers because they form a central part of the sperm whale's diet and sperm whales take a lot of feeding. According to one estimate, there could be as many as 30 million species of animals living in the sea, most still undiscovered. The first hint of how truly abundant life is in the deep seas 
didn't come until as recently as the 1960s with the invention of the epibenthic sled, a dredging device that captures organisms not just on and near the seafloor, but also buried in the sediments beneath. In a single one-hour trawl along the continental shelf at a depth of about 1.5 kilometers, Woods Hole oceanographers Howard Sandler and Robert Hessler netted over 25,000 creatures, worms, starfish, sea cucumbers and the like, representing 365 species. Even at a depth of nearly five kilometers, they found some 3,700 creatures representing almost 200 species of organism. But the dredge could capture only those things that were too slow or stupid to get out of the way. In the late 1960s, a marine biologist named John Isaacs had the idea of lowering a camera with bait attached to it and found still more. In particular, dense swarms of writhing hagfish, a primitive eel-like creature, as well as darting shoals of grenadier fish. Where a good food source is suddenly available, for instance, when a whale dies and sinks to the bottom, as many as 390 species of marine creature have been found dining off it. Intriguingly, many of these creatures were found to have come from vents up to 1,600 kilometers away. These included such types as mussels and clams, which are hardly known as great travelers. It is now thought that the larvae of certain organisms may drift through the water until, by some unknown chemical means, they detect that they have arrived at a food opportunity and fall onto it. So why, if the seas are so vast, do we so easily overtax them? Well, to begin with, the world's seas are not uniformly bounteous. Altogether, less than a tenth of the ocean is considered naturally productive. Most aquatic species like to be in shallow waters, where there are warmth and light and an abundance of organic matter to prime the food chain. Coral reefs, for instance, constitute well under 1% of the ocean's space, but are home to about 25% of its fish. Elsewhere, the oceans aren't nearly so rich. Take Australia. With 36,735 kilometers of coastline and over 23 million square kilometers of territorial waters, it has more sea lapping its shores than any other country. Yet, as Tim Flannery notes, it doesn't even make it into the top 50 among fishing nations. Indeed, Australia is a large net importer of seafood. This is because much of Australia's water is like much of Australia itself, essentially desert. A notable exception is the Great Barrier Reef off Queensland, which is sumptuously fecund. Because the soil is poor, it produces practically no nutrients in its runoffs. Even where life thrives, it is often extremely sensitive to disturbance. In the 1970s, fishermen from Australia, and to a lesser extent New Zealand, discovered shoals of a little-known fish living at a depth of about 800 meters on their continental shelves. They were known as Orange Ruffy. They were delicious, and they existed in huge numbers. In no time at all, fishing fleets were hauling in 40,000 tons of Ruffy a year. Then, marine biologists made some alarming discoveries. Ruffy are extremely long-lived and slow maturing. Some may be 150 years old. Any Ruffy you have eaten may well have been born when Victoria was queen. Ruffy have adopted this exceedingly unhurried lifestyle because the waters they live in are so resource poor. In such waters, some fish spawn just once in a lifetime. Clearly, these are populations that cannot stand a great deal of disturbance. Unfortunately, by the time this was realized, the stocks had been severely depleted. Even with good management, it'll be decades before the populations recover if they ever do. Elsewhere, however, the misuse of the oceans has been more wanton than inadvertent. Many fishermen fin sharks, that is, slice their fins off, then dump them back into the water to die. In 1998, shark fins sold in the Far East for over $110 a kilo, and a bowl of shark fin soup retailed in Tokyo for $100. The World Wildlife Fund estimated in 1994 that the number of sharks killed each year was between 40 million 
and 70 million. As of 1995, some 37,000 industrial-sized fishing ships, plus about a million smaller boats, were between them taking twice as many fish from the sea as they had just 25 years earlier. Trawlers are sometimes now as big as cruise ships and haul behind them nets big enough to hold a dozen jumbo jets. Some even use spotter planes to locate shoals of fish from the air. It is estimated that about a quarter of every fishing net hauled up contains bycatch, fish that can't be landed because they are too small or of the wrong type or caught in the wrong season. As one observer told The Economist, we're still in the dark ages. We just drop a net down and see what comes up. Perhaps as much as 22 million tons of such unwanted fish are dumped back in the sea each year, mostly in the form of corpses. For every kilogram of shrimp harvested, about four kilograms of fish and other marine creatures are destroyed. Large areas of the North Sea floor are dragged clean by beam trawlers as many as seven times a year, a degree of disturbance that no ecosystem can withstand. At least two-thirds of species in the North Sea, by many estimates, are being overfished. Across the Atlantic, things are no better. Halibut once abounded in such numbers off New England that individual boats could land 20,000 pounds of it in a day. Now halibut is all but extinct off the northeast coast of America. Nothing, however, compares with the fate of cod. In the late 15th century, the explorer John Cabot found cod in incredible numbers on North America's eastern banks, shallow areas of water popular with bottom-feeding fish like cod. The fish existed in such numbers, an astonished Cabot reported, that sailors scooped them up in baskets. Some of the banks were vast. Georgia's banks off Massachusetts is bigger than the state it abuts. The Grand Banks off Newfoundland is bigger still, and for centuries was always dense with cod. They were thought to be inexhaustible. Of course, they were anything but. By 1960, the number of spawning cod in the North Atlantic had fallen to an estimated 1.6 million tons. By 1990, this had sunk to 22,000 tons. In commercial terms, the cod were extinct. Fishermen, wrote Mark Kurlansky in his fascinating history, cod had caught them all. The cod may have lost the Western Atlantic forever. In 1992, cod fishing was stopped altogether on the Grand Banks. But as of autumn 2002, according to a report in Nature, stocks had still not staged a comeback. Kurlansky notes that the fish of fish fillets or fish fingers was originally cod, but then was replaced by haddock, then by redfish, and lately by Pacific pollock. These days, he notes dryly, Fish is whatever is left. Much the same can be said of many other seafoods. In the New England fisheries off Rhode Island, it was once routine to haul in lobsters weighing 9 kilograms. Sometimes they reached over 13 kilos. Left unmolested, lobsters can live for decades, as much as 70 years, it is thought. But they never stop growing. Nowadays, few lobsters weigh more than 1 kilogram on capture. Biologists, according to the New York Times, estimate that 90% of lobsters are caught within a year after they reach the legal minimum size at about age six. Despite declining catches, New England fishermen continue to receive state and federal tax incentives that encourage them, in some cases all but compel them, yeah, to acquire bigger boats down. and to harvest oh. the seas more yeah, intensively. Yeah, Today, the fishermen of Massachusetts are reduced to fishing the hideous hagfish, for which there is a slight market in the Far East, but even their numbers are now falling. We are remarkably ignorant of the dynamics that rule life in the sea. While marine life is poorer than it ought to be in areas that have been overfished, in some naturally impoverished waters, there is far more life than there ought to be. The southern oceans around Antarctica produce only about 3% of the world's phytoplankton. Far too little, it would seem, to support a complex ecosystem. And yet they do. Crab-eater seals are not a species of animal that most of us have heard of. 
but they may actually be the second most numerous large species of animal on Earth after humans. As many as 15 million of them may live on the pack ice around Antarctica. There are also perhaps 2 million Weddell seals, at least half a million emperor penguins, and maybe as many as 4 million Adelie penguins. The food chain is thus hopelessly top-heavy, but somehow it works. Remarkably, no one knows how. All this is a very roundabout way of making the point that we know very little about Earth's biggest system. But then, as we shall see, once you start talking about life, there is a great deal we don't know, not least how it got going in the first place. Chapter 19, The Rise of Life. In 1953, Stanley Miller, a graduate student at the University of Chicago, took two flasks, one containing a little water to represent a primeval ocean, the other holding a mixture of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide gases to represent the Earth's early atmosphere, connected them with rubber tubes and introduced some electrical sparks as a stand-in for lightning. After a few days, the water in the flasks had turned green and yellow in a hearty broth of amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, and other organic compounds.